Good morning and welcome to day three, our final day of NACU Next for this year. We always like to check on you as we head into the home stretch. If you are anything like me, you've got distractions, email messages, and to-dos piling up. It's easy to jump back into the work and just keep carrying on, but you're here this morning and continuing to fill your cup. So take a deep breath, recognize it's all going to be there when you exit this conference and go back to the daily grind. Take this last precious day to learn, absorb, grow and improve. Invest in you. Make sure you synthesize everything you've been exposed to this week here at NACU Next. Dot the I's and cross the T's on your notes while it's all fresh and start to think about how to translate learning into action. Use this information to help continue your journey with quality learning and application. So what's in store for today? Well, NACU is thrilled to have partnered with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation on a content collaboration for this final day of NACU Next. This collaboration is even more relevant as we lead into tomorrow's World Patient Safety Day, reminding us to take pause and to honor all the efforts underway to help combat medical error and the injuries and even tragic fatalities that come from it. We know medical errors in hospitals are the third leading cause of death here in the US, just behind heart disease and cancer. And globally, it is believed medical errors kill more people than HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. We know healthcare quality is one of the strongest antidotes to this unfortunate reality, and we are excited to bring you more from that perspective, the perspective of the patients we all ultimately serve today through some rich content and sessions. Before we dismiss into our day, I want to make sure you are aware that NACU can support your broader organization on its journey to higher levels of workforce readiness around healthcare quality competencies. I mention this because I know as just one employee at a system of thousands of employees myself, it can feel daunting at times and almost like I'm shout shouting in the woods to be talking about quality so broadly across a diverse organization of employees at various levels with various levels of tenure or lived experience in the industry. It's hard to get everyone on the same page. NACU is here to help. NACU offers what it calls team training, which are modules and resources that non-quality professionals can consume to help really set the deck for you and establish a common baseline and, co and vocabulary around quality. It can put some wind in your cells and believe me, it won't at all break the bank. I know budgets are tight right now. You can learn more about that by visiting the team training section of NACU's website or simply send an email to teamtraining at naqu.org and our staff will send you some information that you can circulate internally. A, a few quick housekeeping reminders as we prepare to dismiss into the day. First, remember to complete your evaluation to earn your CE credits. Second, don't forget you have access to all these sessions plus two dozen additional on-demand sessions until October 23rd, 2020. And finally, be on the lookout for more information soon about Healthcare Quality Week coming up in mid-October. NACU will be providing tremendous resources and tools to help you advance this noble profession and help you get everyone back at your facility or system excited to take quality to the next level. Let's make the most of this last day of NACU Next. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Michael Ramsey, who will be kicking off our morning with a short but powerful opening session. Dr. Ramsey is chairman of the Department of Anesthesiologist and Pain Management at Baylor University Medical Center and past president of the Baylor Scott and White Research Institute. Following Dr. Ramsey's opening session, our next speakers will include David Meyer, the executive director of the MedStar Institute for Quality and Safety. Helen Haskell, the president of Mothers Against Medical Error. Mike Durkin, senior advisor on patient safety policy and leadership for the NIHR Imperial College Patient Safety Translational Research Center. Leah Binder, president and CEO of the LeapFrog Group. And Steve Muthing, chief quality officer and the co-director of the James M. Anderson Center 
for Health System Excellence at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center and Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. Please join me in giving these speakers a warm welcome. Carol, thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. And it's a great honor for me to be here uh, talking in front of the National Association of Healthcare, Healthcare Quality. Uh, my name is Mike Ramsey, and I'm uh, the chairman of the board of directors of uh, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, and I'm also chair of the Department of Anesthesiology at Baylor University Medical Center. I have no conflicts of interest related to this topic. So the Patient Safety Movement Foundation was founded by a California businessman in, 19, in uh, 2012, Joe Kiani. He, he's involved in the healthcare industry. And uh, when he became aware of the number of errors being made in healthcare and the patient harm and mortality associated with those errors, uh, his industrial background, where particularly electrical engineering, he wanted to apply the same principles that they apply in engineering to healthcare. In other words, find the most safest protocol and mandate it, have it put into practice so that uh, we use the safest techniques and the safest protocols on everything we do so we can eliminate patient error uh, and patient harm and patient death. So with that, uh, we have a summit every year, except of course this year with COVID, uh, where we bring leaders in from around the country and around the world to present um, safety topics that we can apply to healthcare. And uh, this is Dr. Tedros uh, from the um, uh, World Health Organization. That's topical at the moment because they've got uh, Patient Safety Day coming up next month on September the 17th. And uh, we're here to create free resources for our hospitals and patients and uh, our solutions, which we call apps, which are really protocols that um, we can apply to various areas in healthcare where errors and patient harm occur more frequently. An example would be that uh, uh, Houston Methodist um, came up with a protocol for reducing central line infections they were able to reduce it to zero and prove it. And so that was something we embraced. So we will create these protocols that have proof associated with them that can show that they eliminate patient harm. And so that's the premise behind what we're trying to do. Uh, and uh, we, as I say, we bring together the leaders like Dr. Tedros, uh, and we look at the problem that we're addressing, which is estimated from Johns Hopkins to be around 200,000 preventable patient deaths in US hospitals a year, 200,000, and 4.8 million globally. It's the third leading cause of death in the United States behind heart disease and cancer, and the 14th leading cause of death globally more than TB, malaria, and HIV combined. And the cost is just unbelievable uh, to healthcare in the United States, but also in the world. And so tremendous savings financially, as well as in patients' lives, if we can fix this problem. And so what have we done so far since 2012 to 2020? Our goal was zero preventable deaths by 2020. Well. We're there now, and we haven't got down to zero. But looking at independent audits of the lives saved, we estimate there are about 366,000, 353 lives saved where people instigated these apps or these protocols uh, into their hospitals and healthcare systems. And we've also asked healthcare companies, technology companies, to open, have an open data pledge where they share the data that their monitors create, not the IP, but the data so that uh, these monitors all speak to each other. If you look into our operating rooms today, there's still many different boxes 
they're almost black boxes, we call them, with patient data appearing on them. If we can integrate that data, we can pick up abnormalities occurring to patients much faster. And so now we've got a large number of companies sharing that data so that we can integrate it and help use artificial intelligence to help predict when a patient may be getting into trouble. And so we have now political leaders as well involved because for a politician, you know, this is both sides of the house. You save lives, you save money. Which politician would not get behind that? And we've had great support from President Clinton, Vice President Biden, as well as Jeremy Hunt, uh, who uh, ran for British Prime Minister this last time. And these leaders have helped us try to get to our goal of zero. And now having got to 2020, where we're not there yet, we can no longer plan or no longer hope for zero. We must plan for zero. And uh, hashtag plan for zero is a link that you can link on and uh, see where we are in this uh, uh, venture. Now, just to bring in front of you some of the uh, more awful um, medical errors that have hit the news in the last year or two uh, and see this one from Vanderbilt where the nurse gave the wrong medication, supposed to have given a sedative to a patient going into a MRI scanner, but unfortunately gave a muscle relaxant so the patient couldn't breathe and that patient died. And you can see CMS threatened to terminate Vanderbilt's Medicare contract after this fatal medication error. And I bring that up because one, it sh just shows in real life, these errors are still happening. But two, what is the solution? Is the solution to terminate Vanderbilt's Medicare contract or is it to look at the process and correct the process? Here's another one, a Houston hospital replaces leadership after blood transfusion mistake. Well, again, there's a punishment associated with this error. And will that lead to better transparency about hospital errors, healthcare errors, or will it lead to people shutting down and not talking about them, which is really this, the practice at the moment. We need high reliability organizations in our healthcare systems. We need leadership there. We need a culture of safety. We need non-punitive environment. We want accountability. You know, if you vary from a protocol that's been shown to be the safe protocol, absolutely there needs to be accountability. But on the two areas that we've just talked about, neither of those errors were done intentionally. Nobody cut a corner there. It was a process. They wanted to take care of their patients, but the process wasn't safe. And we need these standardization and hardwired safety protocols in place, like they have in industry, like we have in aircraft uh, uh, flying as well in that industry. Those parameters are out there. We need to hardwire them into healthcare and co cause all our healthcare systems to be high reliability organization. Lucien Leap came up with this comment a number of years back. The single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. We need to put the protocols in so the mistakes don't happen. Then if you cut a corner, absolutely will make you accountable. But if you go with the protocol, mistakes should not happen. So how do we change the culture? And it's leadership. And here's one leader who did that in the United Kingdom. And this is Jeremy Hunt. He decided that doctors who make honest mistakes shouldn't be disbarred, shouldn't have their license taken away. They'll get more support to eradicate those mistakes that will put the protocols in place in the National Health Service in the UK so that it's a safe healthcare system. And that's one of the first times that at a national level, this has been put in place with great results. So where are we now with the patient safety movement? Our vision now is zero preventable patient deaths by 2030 and focusing on eliminating preventable harm as well as death in the healthcare system across the world by creating a sense of urgency uh, and, and uh, getting these 
best practices out there so that people know how they can prevent these uh, errors and prevent harm and prevent death. So we have nine strategic aims in the foundation. Prioritizing safety with patients at the center. Promote dignity, compassion, and respect in healthcare. Aligning everyone who influences or touched by healthcare. And those have us all aligned in these protocols so that everybody in the system will speak up uh, if there's a problem. Promote transparency so we all learn from a mistake. Realign the incentives to achieve safer care. Bring patients and families and caregivers all together around patient safety. Create these protocols, which we call apps, uh, and, and promote them. Put them out there so everybody can learn from them. Keep them as living documents so that if you can show us a better protocol and prove it, we'll put it out there. We'll change our apps uh, and have this super highway where technology companies share data as well. So how do we get there? What's our strategic plan? It's funding, of course. We have to have funding to be able to do this. It's creating awareness so that uh, across healthcare systems, people understand the safe practices. They can download them. They can get online and see them immediately and uh, institute them in their hospitals. We want legislation so that uh, the elected officials can promote aligning incentives with safety, transparency, and preventing harm. And we want to partner, not just with hospitals and uh, patients, but industry as well. So we create a safe industry, just like the airline industry, where we investigate rapidly any problems that occur and uh, if the protocols are not followed, uh, we obviously intervene at that point. But if they were followed, where did they go wrong? How can we make them better and safer? So these apps are out there. They're blueprints to safe care. They're online. They're educational resources attached to them, videos, webinars, white papers. Uh, and um, they can be downloaded um, by any health care system, any clinician, any nurse, any patient can download these apps. They're the best practices and they all relate to different parts of the healthcare system, the body, from the head, from mental health, to the chest, airway safety, to fluid and electrolytes, obstetric safety, uh, pressure ulcers, medication safety, right drug, right patient. Um, all these things can be hardwired and put in place. Uh, and that's the foundation of what these apps are about. So the road to patient safety success is transparency, is patient and family partnerships, is human factors integration, reliability, culture, core values, and it's process design. These are all things to hardwire safety that we can put into our healthcare system and optimize outcomes, and we must do it. Is zero possible? Yes, it is with a culture of safety. We can do it. This is my hospital healthcare system. You'll see these on every email from the hospital. You'll walk into any corridor in the hospital and see zero harm uh, signs, posters up there to bring safety to everybody working in the hospital and the patients. And that little square, clear square there is where you put your own commitment uh, and you can change it from month to month. Uh, we look at selected committed hospitals. There are numerous of them out there now where they've instigated many of these apps. There are even some five-star hospitals that have instigated all of the apps in an effort to reduce uh, preventable patient harm to zero. And one hospital that has done it is the Children's Hospital of Orange County that have even tied their director's pay reimbursement to instituting all these apps and seeing that they're in place. Another area that we've now got to look at since COVID has been here is we did a survey on what is the highest concern in healthcare today 
and to our amazement, it's healthcare worker um, health. In other words, we're seeing healthcare workers going down with COVID, dying of COVID, being fl afflicted with health uh, with uh, COVID, and suddenly the workers are the patients as well as the patients. And so we have to make our hospitals safe to work in. And so that's another area that we're looking at. And uh, to do this, it's initially our healthcare workers did not have personal protective equipment. Now they all do. And that's what keeps them safe. What can you do? Build momentum for patient safety. Plan for change. Don't just hope for change. Make a public pledge that your institution that you go to will implement all the apps. What is measured it improves. What is measured publicly, transparently, improves faster. And join us for World Health Patient Safety Day on September the 17th. Just link on to hashtag unite for a safe care. And uh, we've got now about three hours worth of video uh, from political leaders, healthcare leaders, business leaders, um, leaders from all branches, including uh, entertainment, coming on for 10 minutes uh, sprints of, of uh, video to put together, I think, what's going to be a very exciting and very helpful three hours that we can all log into and see, and it's going to be free. So our hospitals should be safe havens not danger zones, and we can make that difference. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be with you today on our session titled Building a Foundation of Safer Healthcare, Creating and Sustaining Reliability. At the beginning, we wanna make sure that the audience understands that none of the speakers today have any conflict of interest to disclose. Today's session will focus in on one of the eight healthcare quality competencies, this one, safety. The competencies of safety are to assess patient safety culture, apply safety science principles and methods, identify and report patient safety risks and events, and finally, collaborate to analyze patient safety risks and events. We have three learning outcomes for today's session. The first is that we want to reinforce what we've learned about patient safety and the impact on quality and outcomes over the last 20 plus years. Discuss how the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the cracks in the foundation of almost all healthcare organizations. And then finally, identify the components necessary to establish a true culture of safety that is closely aligned with holistic continuous improvement process and a simple model for sustainment. It is my pleasure to turn it over to Helen Haskell right now so she can kick off the first part of this program. So I'm going to talk about high reliability and I'm going to start out by sharing a story which I think is a story that some of you will be familiar with. It's a story of my son, Lewis, um, who died in a teaching hospital at the age of 15. I want to talk a little bit first about Lewis as a person because I think it's so critical that people understand the real lives behind case studies. Um, Lewis was our oldest child. He was our only son. Um, he was top student in our metropolitan area of South Carolina, one of the top students in the country. He was an anthropologist, a historian, a mathematician. He was a soccer player, which was his passion at the age of 15, and also a natural comedian. He kept the other kids in stitches, which needless to say, was a lot more popular with them than with his teachers. We thought he was the most brilliant boy in the world. We thought he would grow up to be one of the um, great men of the 21st century. We couldn't wait to unleash him on the world. So when Lewis had just turned 15, his father and I took him to a teaching hospital for a minimally invasive procedure called the NUS procedure to correct a condition called pectus excavatum which um, as a lot of you know, I'm sure is when the breastbone doesn't grow straight 
and it creates a concave appearance to the chest. It's a cosmetic condition for most people, as it was for Lewis. But we as parents thought it should be corrected, so we took him to the hospital for surgery. As far as we know, the operation went well. Um, but as soon as he came out of surgery, we, things started going wrong. Lewis was not urinating. And that was complicated by the fact that the senior resident in charge of his, his case um, inaccurately prescribed a very low amount of, of IV fluid, something appropriate for a very small child instead of a 15-year-old um, who was already dehydrated. So Lewis was, and that was complicated in turn by the fact that he was taking a lot of pain medications. He had epidural hydromorphone opiates in his epidural, plus um, six hourly injections of Ketorolac, um, NSAID pain medication, which is very widely used in American hospitals, especially now, since um, there are um, so many cautions around opioids but it itself is a high risk medication that can cause very severe side effects, including kidney failure and bleeding and gastric ulcers with perforation. And this last is what happened to Lewis. Um, three days after, the after his surgery, he, um, what, he, he woke up in the morning uh, had a Ketorolac um, injection at six o'clock on a Sunday morning. Half an hour later, he, he was stricken with a sudden severe pain in his upper left abdomen, the area of his stomach. The nurse was initially alarmed. Um, and then she came back and reassured us that it was a, an ileus, just a, a constipation caused by the opiates in his epidural. And that assessment stuck all day, even though it never really fit his symptoms. Um, and it did not change as his symptoms worsened over 30 hours, the next 30 hours of his life, um, with no urine output. Um, and in the morning, when he woke up, well, he never slept. In the morning, when the vital signs technician came around, he had no blood pressure. The the nurses and intern spent over two hours trying to find a blood pressure. They took his blood pressure 12 different times with seven different cuffs. Could not find a blood pressure until the second year resident came from the operating room and announced that she had found a normal blood pressure. A little while later, Lewis went into cardiac arrest. Over 20 people came to the code, but they could not revive him. An autopsy the next morning revealed the ulcer that had killed him and the nearly three quarters of his blood that had um, leaked into his peritoneal cavity. So this is some of what they were missing. His vital signs were in the chart, but not really being followed. And this while it contains details that I haven't mentioned, I just wanted to include it for the purpose of showing that one wrong assumption can lead to a cascade of wrong assumptions. So the initial assessment of the ulcer, ulcer as an ileus um, blinded people to the fact that Lewis was going into shock, was developing peritonitis. When they did test for acute abdomen, it was not a complete test. They forgot to do the the CBC blood count, so never really realized what was going on, um, and on and on. They, they misinterpreted the lab test, ending up with delaying the code for putting in chest tubes for a wrong assessment. And some of the cultural issues I also wanted to, um, to touch on, because these are common not just in healthcare, they're common human reactions. And it occurred to me as I was thinking about that, this um, today, that really these are a way of avoiding having to deal with anything unexpected. You just sort of put your head down. They're trends that we need to learn to overcome if we have a high reliability organization. So let's talk a little bit about high reliability. 
I'm going back to um, the original book, um, Managing the Unexpected, with its five principles of a high, highly reliable organization. So just to go over them briefly, the first principle is preoccupation with failure, um, always looking out for what could go wrong, being prepared. Second is reluctant, reluctance to simplify, not looking for easy answers because easy answers are often not the right answers. Sensitivity to operations, um, assuming that the people who are on the ground have knowledge that you need. Um, commitment to resilience, being prepared to respond to the unexpected, expecting the unexpected. And deference to expertise, making sure that you have the right people um, who can come and be in the right place when you need them. So in Lewis's case, preoccupation with failure. Um, if you assume that any deviation from the expected can lead to failure. Shouldn't there have been routine vigilance for post-operative bleeding or infection? Isn't that why people are in the hospital after an operation? People can get so involved in the day-to-day -day operations that they, they forget the purpose and no one was watching out for something that might have gone wrong in what was really a relatively high-risk procedure. Um, low urine output, shouldn't there be a pathway for handling low urine output, again, not an uncommon phenomenon, and clear training on action to take if somebody has um, aberrant vital signs, such as undetectable blood pressure. Um, looking beyond the easy answers, well, I think actually this is sort of an easy answer. Shouldn't there have been an examination of the patient before making an assumption that he had an alias? which was made by someone who actually didn't see Lewis at all, I think. Um, and the policy of revisiting assumptions about diagnosis when, when symptoms worsen. And this is, this is common for a diagnosis to just stick. Sensitivity to operations. If there had been good communication between the nurses and residents and, and Lewis's doctors, um, this could have had a very different outcome. If the parents, we, had had a way to call the attending physician, it would clearly have had a different outcome. And we put that in place in our state after Lewis died. And critical care outreach, just when ICU nurses, critical care nurses come around to the wards and check to see if patients need help. Commitment to resilience, um, shouldn't there have been? If we're going to be prepared, a rapid response team, clear rules on when you call a code, clear rules on how to conduct a code so that it is not chaotic. In a chain of command, we had a traveling nurse in the critical period. She clearly was uneasy, didn't know what to do um, in, in this situation. And finally, deference to expertise. There were four potential experts in this situation. The first was the on-call surgeon, who also happened to be a critical care expert. If he had actually been called to come in, he would immediately have seen what was going on with Lewis because he was um, clearly going into shock. Even I recognize that. Lewis's surgeon, who should have been they should have been able to contact him on the weekend. He knew the surgical history. As I said, I was the only person who seemed to recognize that Lewis was going into shock, but I didn't know what that meant. I had had first aid years ago. I knew what shock looked like. I didn't know that it could be a fatal condition. And Lewis, who was one of the brightest kids in the state, who was very clear about his situation and had all the information anyone needed. So this all happened a very long time ago. Lewis would be 35 now. Um, we can't change the past. We can't change what happened to Lewis. But I still hear very similar stories even now, even after all these years of patient safety innovation. Healthcare is a remarkably stubborn 
culture. And some of the issues I, I've been thinking about can be found in the medical literature going back to the 1950s, if not before. Um, going over what ifs is really a common phenomenon among bereaved families. It, um, it gives us comfort. It, it gives us the, the hope that somewhere in an alternate world, things were different. Maybe somewhere in an alternate world, there's a, a young doctor, a young entrepreneur, uh, a young researcher watching his mom give a presentation on a computer very far away on some totally different subject um, before turning back to work to continue making his own contribution to the world. We can't save Lewis, but we can save others. And in this new COVID world, it's going to be harder to do that than ever. So my challenge to you is to use these tools that we have at our disposal, which I hope you'll learn more about in this session, and try to make the world a more reliable and a safer place, even when the unexpected occurs. Thank you. And David, I'll pass it back to you. Helen, thank you so much for sharing Lewis's story. Uh, you and I have known each other for so many years, and uh, I know how difficult it is for you to share that story each time, but I know why you do it. You've worked continuously since Lewis's death to try to make healthcare safer for others. So I, and I know many across the country, thank you for that. I wanna build on the foundation that Helen laid down for us uh, and how you really develop a true culture of safety within a health system. I like to start a lot of my talks with this quote. I, I think it is just so uh, perfect for what we're going through today. Uh, medicine used to be simple, ineffective and relatively safe. Now it is complex, effective and potentially dangerous. I remember many years ago, if you had high blood pressure, you went, you saw your primary care physician and you got a medication. You came back a week, 10 days later, and either the medication was working or it wasn't, and, and we'd make some changes. Today, we have had so much advancement in technology and diagnosis and, and medications. Healthcare is doing amazing things today. People are living longer. People are um, living better the certain cancers we've been able to beat and think about surgical procedures, procedures that we'd have to go into hospital for seven days, just 10, 15 years ago, now are done as outpatients. But yet those advancements have not come without risk and the risk in inappropriate or inefficient infrastructure to keep up with the advancements and the rapid pace that we've seen in healthcare today. Almost 10 years ago now, we started a journey at MedStar Health, and we said we wanted to truly change our culture to one of safety and high quality. And at the beginning, we brought an organization called Healthcare Performance Improvement in and, and said, we need you to help us. And together, we not only took their tools, but we built on a lot of the success they had seen and developed our own strategy for success around safety and quality. It was built on five principles. First, process design. We had to make sure that we were following evidence-based best practice, not at one of our hospitals or two of our hospitals, but at all 10 of our hospitals and our non-acute ambulatory facilities. Second, we wanted to lay down the structure of a reliability culture. We wanted to become a resilient organization that used the tools and techniques that have been proven in other industries to provide safe care within healthcare, as well as prioritize and put safety first. We believed we had to build a human factors overlay on top of that resilience culture. And I'll explain more about the human factors side of it in the time I've got with you today. Fourth, we had to really embrace the patient and family voice. As Helen said in her story about Lewis, she could have been a critical part of that team if she was just asked. And I'll tell you, 
over the years, I've learned more from patients and families on how to provide safe, high quality care than I have from many of my colleagues. So we had to really bring that patient voice into our story and into our mission. And finally, we had to put a transparent umbrella over everything. We had to stop lying to ourselves. We had to stop denying that these things happen in healthcare. No, they don't. They are solvable and there are solutions for them. And we had to be open and honest with patients and families. So we create a learning environment. Helen talked briefly about high reliability and the five principles. I, I really like this definition. It's a subset of hazardous organizations that have operated nearly error free for very long periods of time. And many of you know those industries. You look at aviation and the safety record they've had. It's just been amazing. And it didn't come without hard work, but they put their minds, set a goal and have really driven to almost zero preventable harm in aviation. Nuclear energy is another example of that. The Department of Defense, what could we learn from those organizations that have made them risky, yet ultimately very safe in their performance? I used to comment to my friends, why is it in healthcare that we accept or have accepted errors and bad outcomes. I remember seven, eight, nine years ago, good friends, very good clinicians who would tell me that we couldn't get to zero preventable infections with central lines. They said it's just the risk in healthcare. We take care of trauma patients and brain surgery patients. We do cardiac surgery and people are going to get infections and a rate of four infections per thousand catheter days, we should be proud of that. But yet there were people who said, no, we shouldn't and we could do better. And the Keystone Project was developed, which showed you can drive central line infections to zero. And I think it's very important that all of us brace the concept that zero is achievable. It's achievable in ventilator associated pneumonias, it's achievable in central line infections, and it's achievable in other preventable harm scenarios. We may not know all the answers today, or we may not have the technology today, but it doesn't mean tomorrow we won't have that. We gotta to continue to push for that zero in everything we do when it comes to preventable harm. This is one of my favorite slides, uh, and I credit Raj Watwani. I saw him use this many years ago. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, Raj, and Raj is, is the uh, director of the National Center for Human Factors Engineering and Healthcare at MedStar Health. And I said, Raj, where did you find those pictures? And Raj said, Dave, there's a whole website out there. It's got over a thousand pictures of cars driving down the street with gas hoses hanging out of their gas tank. And I went to that website and he was right. In fact, there were even police cars driving down the street in their communities with gas hoses hanging out their gas tanks. And I will guarantee you one thing, those people didn't wake up in the morning and say, I'm gonna go down to my gas station and I'm gonna pimp the owner, I'm gonna put the gas hose in the tank and I'm gonna drive away with it. No, they made a mistake. We all make mistakes. I know many times with ATM machines and the cards and losing our cards and the things that the banks had to do using human factors applications to limit or reduce and now almost make it impossible to forget to leave your card. One of my favorite stories is I set coffee up every night before I go to bed and I put the coffee grounds in, I put the water in. So in the morning when I wake up, all I got to do is hit the button. And when I come back five minutes later, coffee is made. I do this every morning. Yet once about every two months, I walk back into the kitchen and I find a pot of hot water because the night before, because of distractions or thinking about other things, I forgot to put the coffee in the coffee pot. Again, those are errors that are just common. We make them every day. James Reason said, we cannot change the human condition, but we can change the conditions under which humans work. This is the essence of what Human Factors tries to do is knowing that we will make a mistake there was a research study that came out a couple of years ago that said pilots make one mistake per hour in the cockpit. But those mistakes have been trapped through human factors applications, through checklists, through other things, so they don't move forward and cause 
an error that can be catastrophic. We've got to embrace rebuilding systems and processes and putting resources into protecting those at the front line who go to work every day to heal. Many times, like all of us, we can make a mistake at the front lines. Here's a great example by another um, human factors national expert, Terry Fairbanks. Terry and his team did a study about a defibrillator. This is a common piece of equipment we use every day. And yet, in testing with this defibrillator, they found that in use, one out of every five times in the heat of the battle, when the stress is on and you use this machine over and over, the person who says to give the charge and the person then gives the charge hits the green button versus the red shock button. They do this because our mental model tells us green means go, it's safe. Red means stop, it's bad. And so what happens with this computerized piece of equipment? When you hit the on button, it turns itself off. And then you panic, you said, oh, I hit the wrong button, you hit the on button again. It's a computer, it takes two to two and a half minutes to reboot. One of every five times this machine had been used, that patient lost two and a half minutes that could have made a difference in saving their life. We have to improve the equipment we provide and give to our frontline care. And then we put them into situations like this and we say, don't make a mistake, be safe. Our environment is just overwhelmed with these types of situations and we've got to protect our caregivers much better in the course of work they do every day. I talked a little bit about transparency. We embraced what's referred to as candor. I think many of you may have now heard of this AHRQ developed toolkit that's out there in the public domain. You just have to go to the AHRQ website and you can download the whole uh, candor toolkit. It is an amazing program that allows you to learn and also follow models like the NTSB and aviation was based on work done by many across the country, but anchored on work done by the University of Illinois in Chicago in a program called the Seven Pillars. It is a comprehensive patient safety program that uses aspects of what we call a go team approach. There are three go teams that are activated, very similar to what aviation does when there's an accident or a mishap. They don't wait for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. They immediately activate and send people to that site to understand what happened to do interviews. And that's what Candor is based on. Three separate GO teams. First, we need to know what happened. An event review that's based on human factors and NTSB-like approach. And the second GO team is to communicate with the patient and family about what we know. And sometimes we don't know anything at the beginning, but they're as confused as we are and why care went in the direction we hadn't counted on. So you've got to immediately start those conversations. And third, one of the most important parts is care for the caregiver. No one comes to work to harm anybody. And when things don't go right, we all feel devastated and we need to support our people at the front lines. And one thing I wanna emphasize is candor is not a medical malpractice strategy. Programs that have implemented candor have seen significant reductions in their medical malpractice expenses. But CANDOR is a patient safety program, a comprehensive one that has proven to save lives. It has numeri, numerous secondary benefits like lowering medical malpractice, improving trust between patients and families. But the main thing that CANDOR allows us to do is to learn immediately so we can fix our systems using human factors approaches that make us better so we don't have the same mistakes occur over and over and over again. It also embraces a just and fair culture. And we need that because we've known too many people who have either taken their lives or left healthcare because we blamed them for a mistake that led to harm that any of us might've made in the same situation under the same circumstances. Lucian Leap, the, the expert and, and father of patient safety has said the single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. We have to stop that and we've got to embrace and take care of our caregivers. Sydney Decker is one that I like. David Marks, James Reasons have all done tremendous work about fair and just culture, but I love Sydney Decker's work. Sydney Decker says just culture is the balance between the safety of science and accountability. 
we must ask what is responsible, not who is responsible. Yet we also have to have calls for accountability because if we blame the system or the process every time, that becomes anarchy and you can do whatever you want and get away with it. So we've got to hold ourselves accountable and those at the front line accountable who recklessly and knowingly put patients at risk when they're taking care of them. We can't tolerate that. We've got to be fair and just to those that are trying to heal, but we've also got to hold those that are reckless accountable. Um, again, so I encourage you to um, read Sidney Decker's work. It's, it's really quite impressive. I will stop there. Uh, Helen, I'd like to turn it back to you. We've got an outstanding panel now that's gonna continue these conversations and uh, build on the foundation hopefully you and I have laid down so far. Thank you, David. That was excellent. Um, now I want to turn to our panelists. We have three very distinguished panelists uh, with us today who Mike Ramsey has already introduced to you. I just want to um, remind you of who they are. Dr. Mike Durkin, um, who is um, lower left on my screen, the Senior Advisor on Patient Safety Policy and Leadership from the Institute of Global Health Innovation in London. Um, Dr. Steve Muthing, Chief Quality Officer, Co-Director of the James Anderson Center for Health Systems Excellence at Cincinnati Children's in Ohio. And Leah Binder, President and CEO of the LeapFrog Group, which is a business group that rates safety and quality in hospitals and healthcare systems. Um, welcome to all of you. We're so glad to have you here. Um, I want to have each of our panelists tell you a little bit more about their particular area of interest and, and what they have done in it. Um, over the years. So Leah, I'm going to start with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and about what you do at LeapFrog? Sure. Thank you, Helen. And thank you for your remarks today. They were very moving and powerful and really inspirational to me personally. So I thank you. I um, started at LeapFrog 12 years ago. LeapFrog is a business coalition that aims to improve the quality and safety of Healthcare. We started with hospitals. We've now moved into ambulatory surgery centers as well. Uh, we do so by uh, publicly reporting on the performance of hospitals and comparing hospitals uh, among each other so that the public can make informed decisions about where to seek care. And also so employers and other purchasers of health benefits can be wiser about how they spend their benefit dollars and can begin to reward excellence as opposed to simply fee-for-service rewarding every service, regardless of whether it leads to the right outcome. And patient safety is perhaps the greatest example you can think of, of where fee-for-service and models of payment have been total failures. Because patient safety is really about care and services, so to speak, that you, don't, you never want to see happen. These are things no one ever wants to have happen, including the providers themselves. Nobody wants to see the errors and infections and accidents happen, and we certainly don't want to have to pay for them either. Uh, but unfortunately, our payment system has made that, uh, has made a colossal error in just kind of just, just constantly paying for everything and not looking at these really important issues for patients. So uh, me personally, I'm not a, a clinician, but my interest in healthcare, I think, has and patient safety in particular, has come from um, watching family members, particularly my dad, be overlooked in the healthcare system. My dad had excellent care. It didn't work out. He died when he was 42 of a heart disease. But, uh, but nonetheless, he, he, he did get excellent care, except for the fact that when he pressed the call button, they didn't come right away. There was a lot of talking about him as the case in that bed, as opposed to this human being. And I just remember that was one of the most, uh, I was young then, I was in my 20s, and it was the most uh, devastating aspect of his disease was the fact that they just saw him as this cog in a bed, this this thing. And here was my dad. This was the, such an important, precious person and loved one in my life. And they treated him as as not a real person, as a, you know, as, as a, a, a cog, a, a thing. 
And that really bothered me. And I think that, if anything, has driven my interest in patient safety, because I do believe that problems in patient safety are fundamentally about not recognizing the absolute critical importance of every single patient 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter how detailed and how, how, um, how simple the issue seems to be. You should never, uh, you always have time for the patient. You always have time to wash your hands. You always have time to do the little things that will, that will make such an enormous difference in the life of that patient and their loved ones. So that I think for me is what has driven my own passion around this issue. Thank you, Leah. Um, that's very, very helpful and very moving as well. Um, Steve, I'd like to turn to you just to give us a little background about your um, long and varied and storied career. Um, if you could. Sure. <laughs> well, uh, it's great to be here with Leah and Mike and, and you, Helen. And, um, you know, I, I will just start by saying I'm a husband, I'm a dad, I'm a grandpa, and, I, and, I, and I'm a pediatrician who started his career first 13 years being a small town doctor. And I share that because of your story, Helen. Um, you know, I think the thing I've learned throughout my career is, and as Leah pointed out, safety's personal. Uh, yes, we need to think about systems, high reliability, situation awareness, but when you cut through all of it, it's, it's people, it's personal. My career uh, has been varied. I uh, came back to Cincinnati Children's a little over 20 years ago and eventually became the safety officer. And um, along the way, I helped, I was one of the people who were able to help start Solutions for Patient Safety, which has now grown to almost 150 children's hospitals across the US and Canada, all learning and sharing together to, with the goal to eliminate serious harm. But uh, in terms of high reliability and situation awareness, I hate to say it, Helen, but uh, it really started my very first year as a safety officer with a story that's not dissimilar from Lewis. Um, and it changed me forever. And what it really kicked off shortly after that event was a multi-year learning from researchers and experts in military uh, who taught me deeply about what they had learned over the previous 10 to 20 years about situation awareness. And I would describe the next five to 10 years was Cincinnati Children's trying to understand what those military experts were trying to teach us, trying to figure out what might be applicable to healthcare and then putting it into place. And eventually it led to tremendous cultural, structural process changes that continue to play out to this day that started from that one event. And I, and I, although I would describe it as not done, we still have work to do, but uh, on the other hand, I would say it's what ought to happen when events like Lewis or, or the event I'm thinking of happen. We owe it to the families to uh, learn and change and improve. Thank you, Steve. That, that was really great. Um, Mike, let me turn to you and you had let you bring some of the international perspective and policy perspective to bear on this. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about um, what you've done. Sure. Thank, thank you, Helen. And uh, great to, to hear Stephen and Leah uh, before me. Um, and of course, you and, 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 and Dave. So, um, yeah, I'll try and bring some international experience, but um, my story actually is, I'm a, my, my specialty uh, was anesthesiology and critical care medicine. Um, and uh, I did my training in, in the UK. And then um, my first uh, attending position uh, and faculty position was actually in the States, in the US, um, where I was offered an opportunity to work at Yale, uh, at the School of Medicine there. and, and um, at Yale New Haven Hospital, and it was at that time, and this was in the in the eighties, um, um, uh, and at that time we were just starting the, if you like, the early steps towards understanding how to analyze critical incidents, 
Um, and I was privileged to work with a fantastic set of, of uh, clinicians uh, and, and scientists at, at Yale um, who really opened my eyes um, to uh, the start of a process, I think, which for me has then kept with me over the last, uh, last uh, decades, um, mainly learning that uh, you learn more from the patient than you do from your peers. Uh, and that the patient is often the most expert in the room when it comes to understanding what's going on. In fact, their first visits to a doctor are often because, or a nurse, are often because they've understood something isn't quite right. Um, uh, and then, as we've all explained and, and had listened to on today's um, uh, presentations and panels, uh, how often is it that the, the experts in the room uh, are the ones who haven't listened uh, to the patient or the family who knows them best? So I spent a, a, many years, happy, very happy years in, in the US, and then I came back to the UK and um, I decided I wanted to change some of the elements that we, we were working in, in in the system that I was part of. And, and as you know, the UK is a national health service uh, that looks after the uh, the needs of its 60, 65 million people uh, and very much has one system. Uh, there are opportunities to use other systems, but it tends to be 90% of the, of the funded care is one system. Uh, and I was given the opportunity to um, become an executive director of the hospital that I was um, then uh, an attending at. And uh, I started to also get the opportunity to develop what was part of a, a, a collaborative system, if you like, um, of learning about clinical governance. How do we, what structures do we need to put in place to both, uh, both monitor clinical performance, but also to support learning? Uh, and then how do we then translate that into a, a unified system? Uh, and that uh, culminated in an approach uh, at the end of the last century of organization with the memory and also with with others um, working with the, the N Institute of Medicine in terms of to her as human and, and crossing the quality chasm. So both both systems were actually coming together, I think, to create that that environment. Um, I then, as far as my colleagues were concerned, I then I went very dark. Um, then I, I crossed I crossed the um, the corridor and became um, be, um, joined the management system uh, a little bit, uh, a bit more than they wanted me to, I think. But that get, got me into uh, much more of looking at systems and the system management of, of the way the system worked. And for me, that ended up being um, the medical director of the region that we were working in England and then of the south of England. Um, and then I ended up becoming the national director um, um, of, of patient safety for, for the UK. And, and for me, many, many stories, many, many stories um, that, uh, are, you, that fill me with sadness often um, that um, things haven't changed as much as they should be um, and that we are uh, still finding out the same, the same issues, the same issues of um, lack of sharing of information, uh, the, that um, uh, the what ifs um, are, are built on the same elements um, of, of lack of candor, uh, of lack of um, really placing the patient at the center of our journey as a, I'm working as a collaborative team uh, with the patient in the, in the center of that. Um, uh, I've got lots to say about, uh, about issues that we may want to come on to, um, but I think that um, uh, I'll leave it to there for the moment, but really, really pleased now to be working now in, the, uh, um, in this environment and uh, working very closely now in, with other global systems, particularly looking at lower middle income countries and how we can help those systems. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was, um, that was very interesting. Um, one of the things that you all have said is talking about the personal uh, the importance of the patient voice. And I'm just wondering um, how you think the patient voice could and should be elevated. I certainly have my own ideas as a patient, but, um, but I'm curious what you all think would be the, the pathway through, through the healthcare system. Um, well, I'll start with you, Mike, since you said yeah. that last. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come in definitely first. So I think I, I think our journey to 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 that end 
um, to ensure that the patient and their family, because it's it's the family around, it's the primary caregivers are often around in the family. So that uh, that that journey to understanding the role and primacy of, of the patient and their family, I think, needs to be needs to be at uh, way short of of when we're talking to mainly trained professionals. So this needs to be part of the journey that all our undergraduates, all our postgraduates need to be by, bought into um, so that really, we really understand in our learning systems uh, of the value of the expertise that the patient and the family brings um, to not only to their presenting um, um, uh, story, uh, but their ongoing journey, particularly um, now as uh, as uh, our demographics are shifting into multiple long-term conditions where uh, our patients are often um, journeying between physicians and between nurses um, uh, who represent uh, specialty interests for different long-term conditions. The patient is often the one person and the family is often the one person who carries all that information with them. Um, and so for some of our, our major concerns, um, I think globally, uh, 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 around the management of long-term conditions, the management of, of comorbidity, re resolve often around medical, uh, around medicines management and medicines reconciliation, uh, and understanding the, the issues that are, are faced by patients, and, uh, and often our our, um, our our systems haven't really given that opportunity. So I think learning early on and making sure that learning progresses during all our training is a key one. I think often the most difficult, uh, uh, difficult individuals to uh, to bring into this conversation uh, are those uh, are probably at my age, uh, the, the senior the senior end um, who have always done it this way uh, and and find it very difficult therefore to sort of translate themselves back into that listening phase. Um, so hierarchy is a big issue, uh, and in some some settings around the world, I think the other issue is gender. Gender is a very big issue. Um, and also ethnicity is a big issue uh, in, in many systems about understanding the role uh, of the patient and uh, the, the, the nurse or the doctor and, and the primacy of the patient as opposed to the primacy of the, the expert. So that would be for one. One area for me would be education, education, education uh, in that system. Um, I'd like to come on to leadership at a later stage because I think that is also another key, a, a key element to this. Um, certainly at a national level, and therefore probably at most systems uh, that are in place too. Yeah, well, thank you. That's that's very informative, and we will come back to leadership. Um, Steve, what do you think about um, learning systems, which I know is what you've really specialized in um, through your entire career, and, and how, how that... Um, reflects on the, the patient point of view and involving the patient, how, are the, how do they intersect? Yeah, I, uh, Mike, I, I just wanna say, as a pediatrician and a, a dad and grandpa, I agree with everything you just said, but my mind did go to how uh, families, and um, in our case, uh, across all the children's hospitals really is a learning system, a learning network, uh, how valuable that voice has been in the ongoing journey and the improvement part, not on any individual patient episode, but helping us accelerate. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the term learning system or learning network, uh, there's a lot of publications, uh, both from the UK and from the US, the National Academy of Medicine in the US. But you know, the way I would describe it is a small usually group of people come together and that's where the the families and the clinicians and the improvers come to find each other and realize they all have the ultimate same goal and that they want to come together they adopt a bold audacious goal and that in our case it's to eliminate all serious harm from every children's hospital they then learn the importance of social networking and uh, because they learn that change and all of us tend to adopt new things based on what our social network is doing 
sometimes much more importantly than what data tells us or even what we read in the literature. And so the importance of building that social network and bringing patients and families in as part of that social network. Don't isolate ourselves over, we're scientists and your patients. No, it's one social network. And then ultimately what really gets a learning network going is sharing everything. And most importantly, data. And then using that data to learn, 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 and learn from variation, learn from positive outliers, and ultimately to use that data to analyze and come to learn what are the best practices that are associated with reduction in harm and then adopt them. And the amazing thing about learning networks is they're essentially creating real-time evidence and they adopt it quickly because they're creating the evidence. It's not somebody else's evidence, it's our evidence. So why wouldn't we adopt it? And when it's us together, it's the patients, it's the researchers, it's the improvers, it's the clinicians, it's that power of everybody coming together and realizing they have the same goal, even though we happen to have different roles. Thanks, that's terrific. And now, Leah, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, you are the one who presents information to the public. You, um, you basically interpret this for people. So tell me how that works and, and what you think the, um, the gaps and the, and the promises. Well, I, I think the, the main issue that we have to focus on to really see change at the inpatient safety, which we have seen some change in recent years. I wish it were more, but it's still change. And that's actually a, a positive sign because we haven't been able to say too many positive things about movement in patient safety, um, at least in my career before this. So, I, I, But I think the key issue is accountability. We have to set standards and we have to be transparent about whether we're meeting those standards. And I think we've come uh, some distance in figuring out how to do that a little bit anyway. We have some measures. We have actual ways of measuring progress in patient safety. We have some outcomes measures. We have some public reporting of infections. Not, a, not enough of any of these things. For instance, I see Steve here, we, we don't have public reporting of, uh, of patient safety in, uh, in children's hospitals, um, unless it's voluntary. And frankly, not enough ho children's hospitals are voluntarily transparent about it, but we, ha we need much more we need for everything, for nursing homes, for, uh, for, for dialysis centers, for every kind of hospital, critical access hospitals. And we need to see more of the progress um, publicly reported. And, and I think what happens then when we set those standards and we publicly report them is that everybody suddenly sees how they're doing and it helps to make progress when you see how you're doing relative to your peers. I think it also helps for the public to become engaged in the whole issue. Because if I understand uh, the difference between two different facilities, because I've seen them publicly reported and I understand that they're not the same, then um, not only does that help in my own decision making, perhaps perhaps it won't perhaps it wouldn't contribute to my decision making. Maybe I just wouldn't be able to be concerned about that. Nonetheless, however, I will articulate that to people in that facility, to my doctor. Why is it that your hospital seems to have a high rate of infection compared to the one down the street? What, what's going on? Those conversations have enormous impact as well. So, so setting standards and transparency allow us to um, hold each other accountable for what we want to see in our healthcare system and motivate the change that we all want to see. So I see hospitals you know, like, uh, like certainly Cincinnati doing incredible work with learning systems and um, I think high reliability health systems is a incredibly important movement and I've seen enormous progress as a result of that movement. So I, I really salute health systems, this is not easy work and they've done that work. Uh, I think what's now the next and most important next step really for all of us is that we, uh, we publicly report the progress and we hold each other accountable for it. So, thank you, Leah. Yeah. Um, Mike, I want to come yeah. back to you. You look okay. like you want to say something. Um, yeah, no, I just want to support Leah, Leah on that. The public reporting uh, of, of, of data is absolutely crucial to the journey of improving, of improving uh, all elements of, of, of safety um, and the wider elements of quality as well. Um, and I think that's a journey that, that, 
that many countries are, are just, just starting. Um, um, many systems are very nervous about it um, because of the, some of the pitfalls that, that they believe would happen. But, but actually, there's a, there's a huge benefit to all societies from public reporting of that data. Um, and we know that works in terms of driving individual clinician performance. Um, uh, and, it, and it also is of huge value in, in driving organizational performance as well and improvement. So, Mike, while you have the microphone, so to speak, um, let's come back to the, the topic of leadership that you had wanted to address earlier. What do you think is the role of leaders and what is a leader? Well, I, I, I'd like to sort of just um, get, get into that on, on the basis that, so Steve mentioned the, 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 the learning network concept, which is absolutely vital uh, for us uh, in terms of how we do it. And, and We've, we've been able to do, introduce a similar um, at a system level in, in, in the UK with, with 15 safety, patient safety collaboratives, we've called them, which, which are based on academic health science networks. So roughly about uh, for our population, uh, we have 15 across the, the, the 60 million or so population. So creates a local, a local hub very much around five, three to five million um, system uh size with with tertiary and secondary hospitals as well as community systems in place and one of the things we we realized that we had to do that uh, at that level was 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 that it was paramount that leaders needed to be engaged and involved and understand what was happening on the front line as well as the national line um, and so therefore for me the concept of leadership at every level is crucial in the de generation of a safety culture for a system and therefore the relevance of a safety color culture at a local level. And so the local level can be the general practice, uh, the family doctor hub. It can be the local community health service system. It can be uh, on the ward um, at a particular ward in an operating theater, uh, as well as at uh, the, the states at the county level or the state level or, or the national level. Um, but it's leadership at every level. And that leadership at every level needs to understand the relationship that they have with each other. So there is absolute respect between leaders all the way through that pathway. Um, and it's only when we have that, that actually we can really start to understand the role of leadership in terms of change and in terms of improvement, in terms of giving permission. Don't, you know, don't, don't, my, my adage as many of us uh, in this field are, is that, you know, you ask for forgiveness rather than wait for permission. Um, uh, and then we must work in a, in a, in a system that is, uh, that our leadership has created a psychologically safe system so that we actually are able to, to work freely, uh, admit our mistakes, uh, uh, not be blamed individually for it, uh, held accountable, as Leah says, uh, but given the opportunity to innovate and change. And I think leadership is at the core of that um, uh, debate to have a set the climate for a culture uh, that really can uh, can deliver the outcomes and outputs that our patients deserve. So for me, leadership is actually key to that. Um, and to give the freedom for action and the freedom for action um, at the level where we need it most, which is the relationship between the nurse, the doctor and the patient. Can I add one thing to that? I think it's a really important point, Mike, but I would add that the leadership should be at the patient level too. Patients yeah, ought yeah. to be leaders of their own care and ought to be empowered to, to take that role. It's very difficult to do it when you're wearing a, a Johnny and your butt's hanging out, <laughs> but they have to be able to do it because it's really critical at that moment. And I think that um, one of the issues you also brought up was, I think, disparities and understanding uh, uh, differences, among, uh, ethnic differences, gender differences in patients, and how that can silence people. I would add in this country, certainly, we've been really awakened to the issue of racial injustice as well, and how that can silence patients. And I think we need to start to think about how do we empower patients more so their voices can be heard. They're the critical voice, I think, in improving safety. I, no, I, I, absolutely, Leah. I, I really believe that too. And I suppose the difficulty often is this this taxonomy that we have developed, um, which often gets in the way sometimes. So it's of, of uh, involvement, engagement, empowerment. It's it's, yeah. um, it's 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 all of those things. But how do we? How do you know, one of the things we could do is really help by by um, by thinking about what is the language we want to use, the common narrative 
uh, that we can we can all support and help our patients with. And but, no, go ahead. I mean, we're about out of time. Saying, Let me okay. make this your final comment. If you can each give me about thirty seconds, um, that would be terrific. Well, I would add one of the things we're looking at is patient reported outcomes and how we can uh, reliably incorporate patient reported outcomes into the overall um, uh, healthcare industry, but also in the way that we hold uh, providers accountable for care and how we report things. And we, we, we haven't really figured out how to do that systematically uh, at a national level, but we are working on it. And I think it's, it is just the voice of the patient is the critical element that I think has been missing and we need to find ways to elevate it. Thank you. Steve, final comments? Well, very briefly, I'll say as a pediatrician and again, as a dad, I've loved the focus on patients and, and partnering. I will though put in one call that ultimately the systems we're trying to create is safety for all and it's safety for the staff and uh, as well as the patients and particularly with everything we've learned during this COVID experience is that we're all at risk. These systems are dangerous for everybody, not just for the patients. And we need to be thinking about everyone's safety and partnering with our staff, just like we're partnering with patients and families. Thank you, important point. Uh, and for me, um, Helen, I would, uh, I would go back to my point about um, creating the ability to create a psychologically safe environment uh, which supports uh, the reporting of when things go wrong, uh, admitting mistakes, and that creates an opportunity for staff to really feel more valued uh, and, and be absolutely part of uh, the process of improvement and reliability. So with a psychologically safe system, uh, then there is uh, reliability will follow. Thank you all. Thank you to our panel. And um, that concludes my questions. I think there will be more, but I really appreciate your being here with us today. And um, I will hand it off. Thank you all for help for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to our panel and our presenters this morning for that moving and valuable presentation. And thank you so much for tying into the NAQ competencies as well. And we are receiving such beautiful and heartfelt comments on our live chat. And Helen, uh, so much positive energy sent to you from those comments as well. So thank you so much. So we're gonna go ahead and move into our Q&A this morning. And my first question is from Jennifer and I'm gonna address it to Helen and it is, how do you address patient safety when those of us within healthcare understand zero harm, but unfortunately society at large is litigious? You know, I, I come at that from the other side. Um, I don't think society at large is litigious. Um, it, most patients are not looking for revenge. They are looking for answers. They're looking for improvement. Um, they're looking for some kind of recognition that their family members or their life matter. And that is what they usually don't get. Uh, patient harm is really widespread. And um, very few people get any kind of um, compensation, any kind of recognition. Uh, of patients who actually seek attorneys, about 2% get their cases taken. And most don't seek attorneys because they often don't know there is a problem. And of those 2%, um, the vast majority do not prevail in their cases, not necessarily because they are not harmed or because their harm wasn't preventable, but because the information isn't there to support what happened in the records. Um, this is really, um, healthcare providers live in fear of litigation, but that's really not the situation outside of the hospital. It, um, this is really one, there's very little justice, very little accountability for harmed patients. Um, 
And this is, um, this is one of the darkest sides of healthcare. But, um, but there are programs, um, communication and resolution programs that have been developed over the years that help hospitals um, deal with uh, patient harm in a humane way that helps both um, the patients and families, gives them the compensation that they need. People almost never have any kind of financial compensation. Um, even when they have been severely harmed, people um, suffer financially enormously aside from everything else. So um, communication and resolution programs try to deal with all that. I'm going to let David tell you more about the details of them because they actually are not more costly. Um, I think you know the issue is it is up to the hospital. The hospital has to behave in a um, in a way that is really full of integrity, and it doesn't work if they don't. And patients are counting on them to do that. So, David, um, could you add something to that? Sure, Helen. Thank you. Um, yeah, our data back at the University of Illinois just confirmed everything you're saying. We were able to settle 